Section three of Cousin Phyllis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Cousin Phyllis by Elizabeth Gaskell. Part two. Section one. Cousin Holman gave me the weekly county newspaper to read aloud to her, while she mended stockings out of a high piled up basket, Phyllis helping her mother. I read and read, unregardful of the words I was uttering, thinking of all manner of other things, of the bright colour of Phyllis's hair, as the afternoon sun fell on her bending head, of the silence of the house, which enabled me to hear the double tick of the old clock which stood half-way up the stairs, of the variety of inarticulate noises which cousin Holman made while I read, to show her sympathy, wonder, or horror at the newspaper intelligence. The tranquil monotony of the hour made me feel as if I had lived for ever, and should live for ever droning out paragraphs in that warm sunny room, with my two quiet hearers, and the curled-up pussy-cat leaping on the hearth-rug, and the clock on the house-stairs perpetually clicking out the passage of the moments. By and by Betty, the servant, came to the door into the kitchen, and made a sign to Phyllis who put her half-mended stocking down, and went away to the kitchen without a word. Looking at cousin Holman a minute or two afterwards, I saw that she had dropped her chin upon her breast and fallen fast asleep. I put the newspaper down, and was nearly following her example, when a waft of air from some unseen source slightly opened the door of a communication with the kitchen, that Phyllis must have left unfastened and I saw part of her figure as she sat by the dresser, peeling apples with quick dexterity of finger, but with repeated turnings of her head towards some book lying on the dresser by her. I softly rose, and as softly went into the kitchen, and looked over her shoulder. Before she was aware of my neighbourhood I had seen that the book was in a language unknown to me, and the running title was L'Inferno. Just as I was making out the relationship of this word to infernal, she started and turned round, and as if continuing her thought as she spoke, she sighed out, "'Oh, it is so difficult! Can you help me?' putting her finger below a line. "'Me? I? I don't even know what language it is in.' "'Don't you see it is Dante?' she replied almost petulantly, she did so want help. "'Italian, then?' said I dubiously, for I was not quite sure. "'Yes, and I do so want to make it out. Father can help me a little, for he knows Latin, but then he has so little time.' "'You have not much, I should think, if you have often to try and do two things at once as you are doing now.' "'Oh, that's nothing. Father bought a heap of old books cheap, and I knew something about Dante before, and I have always liked Virgil so much. Paring apples is nothing if I could only make out this old Italian. I wish you knew it." "'I wish I did,' said I, moved by her impetuosity of tone. "'If now only Mr. Holdsworth were here, he can speak Italian like anything, I believe.' "'Who is Mr. Holdsworth?' said Phyllis, looking up. "'Oh, he's our head engineer. He's a regular first-rate fellow. He can do anything.' My hero-worship and my pride in my chief all coming into play. Besides, if I was not clever and book-learned myself, it was something to belong to some one who was." "'How is it that he speaks Italian?' asked Phyllis. "'He had to make a railway through Piedmont, which is in Italy, I believe and he had to talk to all the workmen in Italian, and I have heard him say that for nearly two years he had only Italian books to read in the queer outlandish places he was in." "'Oh, dear!' said Phyllis. "'I wish—' And then she stopped. I was not quite sure whether to say the next thing that came into my head, but I said it. "'Could I ask him anything about your book, or your difficulties?' She was silent for a minute or so and then she made reply. "'No, I think not. Thank you very much, though. I can generally puzzle a thing out in time. And then, perhaps, I remember it better than if someone had helped me. I'll put it away now, 
and you must move off, for I've got to make the paste for the pies. We always have a cold dinner on Sabbaths. But I may stay and help you, mayn't I? Oh, yes. Not that you can help at all, but I like to have you with me. I was both flattered and annoyed at this straightforward avowal. I was pleased that she liked me, but I was young coxcomb enough to have wished to play the lover, and I was quite wise enough to perceive that if she had any idea of the kind in her head, she would never have spoken out so frankly. I comforted myself immediately, however, by finding out that the grapes were sour. A great tall girl in a pinafore, half a head taller than I was, reading books that I had never heard of, and talking about them too, as of far more interest than any mere personal subjects. That was the last day on which I ever thought of my dear cousin Phyllis as the possible mistress of my heart and life. But we were all the greater friends for this idea being utterly put away and buried out of sight. Late in the evening the minister came home from Hornby. He had been calling on the different members of his flock, and unsatisfactory work it had proved to him. It seemed from the fragments that dropped out of his thoughts into his talk. "'I don't see the men. They are all at their business, their shops, or their warehouses. They ought to be there. I have no fault to find with them. Only if a pastor's teaching all words of admonition are good for anything, they are needed by the men as much as by the women.' "'Cannot you go and see them in their places of business, and remind them of their Christian privileges and duties, minister?' asked Cousin Holman, who evidently thought that her husband's words could never be out of place. "'No,' said he, shaking his head. "'I judge them myself. If there are clouds in the sky, and I am getting in the hay just ready for loading, and rain sure to come in the night, I should look ill upon Brother Robinson if he came into the field to speak about serious things.' "'But at any rate, father, you do good to the women, and perhaps they repeat what you have said to them to their husbands and children.' "'It is to be hoped they do, for I cannot reach the men directly. But the women are apt to tarry before coming to me, to put on ribbons and gourds, as if they could hear the message I bear to them best in their smart clothes. Mrs. Dobson to-day. Phyllis, I am thankful thou dost not care for the vanities of dress.' Phyllis reddened a little as she said in a low, humble voice, "'But I do, father, I'm afraid. I often wish I could wear pretty coloured ribbons round my throat like the squire's daughters.' "'It's but natural, minister,' said his wife. "'I'm not above liking a silk gown better than a cotton one myself.' "'The love of dress is a temptation and a snare,' said he gravely. "'The true adornment is a meek and quiet spirit.' "'And, wife,' said he, as a sudden thought crossed his mind, "'in that matter, too, I have sinned. I wanted to ask you, could we not sleep in the grey room instead of our own?' "'Sleep in the grey room? Change our room at this time of day?' Cousin Holman asked in dismay. "'Yes,' said he. "'It would save me from a daily temptation to anger. Look at my chin,' he continued. I cut it this morning. I cut it on Wednesday when I was shaving. I do not know how many times I have cut it of late, and all from impatience at seeing Timothy Cooper in his work in the yard. He's a downright lazy tyke," said Cousin Holman. He's not worth his wage. There's but little he can do, and what he can do he does badly. True," said the minister. He is but, so to speak, a half-wit and yet he has got a wife and children. More shame for him. But that is past change, and if I turn him off no one else will take him on. Yet I cannot help watching him of a morning as he goes sauntering about his work in the yard, and I watch and I watch till the old Adam rises strong within me at his lazy ways, and some day I am afraid I shall go down and send him about his business, let alone the way in which he makes me cut myself when I am shaving and then his wife and children will starve. I wish we could move to the grey room." I do not remember much more of my first visit to the Hope Farm. We went to chapel in Heathbridge, slowly and decorously walking along the lanes, ruddy and tawny with the colouring of the coming autumn. The minister walked a little before us, his hands behind his back, his head bent down, 
thinking about the discourse to be delivered to this people, cousin Holman said, and we spoke low and quietly, in order not to interrupt his thoughts. But I could not help noticing the respectful greetings which he received from both rich and poor as we went along, greetings which he acknowledged with a kindly wave of his hand, but with no words of reply. As we drew near the town, I could see some of the young fellows we met cast admiring looks on Phyllis, and that made me look too. She had on a white gown, and a short black silk cloak, according to the fashion of the day. A straw bonnet with brown ribbon strings, that was all. But what her dress wanted in colour, her sweet bonny face had. The walk made her cheeks bloom like the rose, the very whites of her eyes had a blue tinge in them, and her dark eyelashes brought out the depths of the blue eyes themselves. Her yellow hair was put away as straight as its natural curliness would allow. If she did not perceive the admiration she excited, I am sure cousin Holman did, for she looked as fierce and as proud as ever her quiet face could look, guarding her treasure, and yet glad to perceive that others could see that it was a treasure. That afternoon I had to return to Eltham to be ready for the next day's work. I found out afterwards that the minister and his family were all exercised in spirit as to whether they did well in asking me to repeat my visits at the Hope Farm, seeing that of necessity I must return to Eltham on the Sabbath day. However, they did go on asking me, and I went on visiting them, whenever my other engagements permitted me, Mr. Holdsworth being in this case, as in all, a kind and indulgent friend. Nor did my new acquaintances oust him from my strong regard and admiration. I had room in my heart for all, I am happy to say, and as far as I can remember, I kept praising each to the other in a manner which, if I had been an older man, living more amongst people of the world, I should have thought unwise, as well as a little ridiculous. It was unwise, certainly, as it was almost sure to cause disappointment if ever they did become acquainted, and perhaps it was ridiculous, though I do not think we any of us thought it so at the time. The minister used to listen to my accounts of Mr. Holdsworth's many accomplishments and various adventures in travel with the truest interest, and most kindly good faith, and Mr. Holdsworth, in return, liked to hear about my visits to the farm, and description of my cousin's life there, liked it, I mean, as much as he liked anything that was merely narrative, without leading to action. So I went to the farm, certainly, on an average, once a month during that autumn. The course of life there was so peaceful and quiet, that I can only remember one small event, and that was one that I think I took more notice of than any one else. Phyllis left off wearing the pinafores that had been so obnoxious to me. I do not know why they were banished, but on one of my visits I found them replaced by pretty linen aprons in the morning, and a black silk one in the afternoon. And the blue cotton gown became a brown stuff one as winter drew on. This sounds like some book I once read, in which a migration from the blue bed to the brown was spoken of as a great family event. Towards Christmas my dear father came to see me, and to consult Mr. Holdsworth about the improvement which has since been known as Manning's driving-wheel. Mr. Holdsworth, as I think I have before said, had a very great regard for my father, who had been employed in the same great machine-shop in which Mr. Holdsworth had served his apprenticeship, and he and my father had many mutual jokes about one of these gentlemen apprentices who used to set about his smith's work in the whitewashed leather gloves, for fear of spoiling his hands. Mr. Holdsworth often spoke to me about my father as having the same kind of genius for mechanical invention as that of George Stevenson, and my father had come over now to consult him about several improvements, as well as an offer of partnership. It was a great pleasure to me to see the mutual regard of these two men. Mr. Holdsworth, young, handsome, keen, well-dressed, an object of admiration to all the youth of Eltham, my father, in his decent but unfashionable Sunday clothes, his plain, sensible face full of hard lines, the marks of toil and thought, his hands, blackened beyond the power of soap and water by years of labour in the foundry, speaking a strong northern dialect, while Mr. Holdsworth had a long, soft drawl in his voice, as many of the southerners have, and was reckoned in Eltham to give himself airs. Although most of my father's leisure time was occupied with conversations about the business I have mentioned, 
He felt that he ought not to leave Eltham without going to pay his respects to the relations who had been so kind to his son. So he and I ran up on an engine along the incomplete line as far as Heathbridge, and went by invitation to spend a day at the farm. It was odd and pleasant to me to perceive how these two men, each having led up to this point such totally dissimilar lives, seemed to come together by instinct, after one quiet, straight look into each other's faces. My father was a thin, wiry man of five foot seven. The minister was a broad-shouldered, fresh-coloured man of six foot one. They were neither of them great talkers in general, perhaps the minister the most so, but they spoke much to each other. My father went into the fields with the minister. I think I see him now with his hands behind his back, listening intently to all explanations of tillage and the different processes of farming occasionally taking up an implement as if unconsciously, and examining it with a critical eye, and now and then asking a question which I could see was considered as pertinent by his companion. Then we returned to look at the cattle, housed and bedded in expectation of the snowstorm hanging black on the western horizon, and my father learned the points of a cow with as much attention as if he meant to turn farmer. He had his little book that he used for mechanical memoranda and measurements in his pocket, and he drew it out to write down straight back, small muzzle, deep barrel, and I know not what else, under the head, cow. He was very critical on a turnip-cutting machine, the clumsiness of which first incited him to talk, and when we went into the house he sat thinking and quiet for a bit, while Phyllis and her mother made the last preparations for tea, with a little unheeded apology from cousin Holman, because we were not sitting in the best parlour, which she thought might be chilly on so cold a night. I wanted nothing better than the blazing, crackling fire that sent a glow over all the house-place, and warmed the snowy flags under our feet till they seemed to have more heat than the crimson rug right in front of the fire. After tea, as Phyllis and I were talking together very happily, I heard an irrepressible exclamation from cousin Holman. "'Whatever is the man about?' and on looking round I saw my father taking a straight burning stick out of the fire, and after waiting for a minute and examining the charred end to see if it was fitted for his purpose, he went to the wood dresser, scoured the last pitch of whiteness and cleanliness, and began drawing with the stick, the best substitute for chalk and charcoal within his reach, for his pocket-book pencil was not strong or bold enough for his purpose. When he had done, he began to explain his new model of a turnip-cutting machine to the minister, who had been watching him in silence all the time. Cousin Holman had, in the meantime, taken a duster out of the drawer, and under pretence of being as much interested as her husband in the drawing, was secretly trying on an outside mark how easily it would come off, and whether it would leave her dresser as white as before. Then Phyllis was sent for the book on dynamics about which I had been consulted during my first visit and my father had to explain many difficulties, which he did in language as clear to his mind, making drawings with his stick wherever they were needed as illustrations, the minister sitting with his massive head resting on his hands, his elbows on the table, almost unconscious of Phyllis, leaning over and listening greedily, with her hand on his shoulder, sucking in information like her father's own daughter. I was rather sorry for cousin Holman. I had been so once or twice before, for do as she would, she was completely unable even to understand the pleasure her husband and daughter took in intellectual pursuits, much less to care in the least herself for the pursuits themselves, and was thus unavoidably thrown out of some of their interests. I had once or twice thought she was a little jealous of her own child, as a fitter companion for her husband than she was herself, and I fancied the minister himself was aware of this feeling, for I had noticed an occasional sudden change of subject, and a tenderness of appeal in his voice as he spoke to her, which always made her look contented and peaceful again. I do not think that Phyllis ever perceived these little shadows. In the first place, she had such complete reverence for her parents that she listened to them both as if they had been St. Peter and St. Paul, and besides she was always too much engrossed with any matter in hand to think about other people's manners and looks. This night I could see, though she did not, how much she was winning on my father. She asked a few questions which showed that she had followed his explanations up to that point. Possibly, too, her unusual beauty might have something to do with his favourable impression of her, but he made no scruple of expressing his admiration of her to her father and mother in her absence from the room, 
and from that evening I date a project of his which came out to me a day or two afterwards, as we sat in my little three-cornered room in Eltham. "'Paul,' he began, "'I never thought to be a rich man, but I think it's coming upon me. Some folk are making a deal of my new machine, calling it by its technical name, and Ellison of the Borough Green Works has gone so far as to ask me to be his partner. "'Mr. Ellison the Justice, who lives in King Street, why, he drives his carriage,' said I, doubting yet exultant. "'Aye, lad, John Ellison. But that's no sign that I shall drive my carriage. Though I should like to save thy mother walking, for she's not so young as she was. But that's a long way off. Anyhow, I reckon I should start with a third profit. It might be seven hundred, or it might be more. I should like to have the power to work out some fancies of mine. I care for that much more than for brass. And Ellison has no lads, and by nature the business would come to thee in the course of time. Ellison's lasses are but bits of things, and are not like to come by husbands just yet, and when they do, maybe they'll not be in the mechanical line. It'll be an opening for thee, lad, if thou art steady. Thou art not great shakes, I know, in the inventing line, but many a one gets on better without having fancies for something he does not see and never has seen. I'm right down glad to see that mother's cousins are such uncommon folk for sense and goodness. I have taken the minister to my heart like a brother, and she is a womanly, quiet sort of a body. And I'll tell you, Frank, Paul, it'll be a happy day for me if ever you can come and tell me that Phyllis Holman is like to be my daughter. I think if that lass is not a penny, she would be the making of a man, and she'll have your house and lands, and you may be her match yet in fortune if all goes well." I was growing as red as fire. I did not know what to say, and yet I wanted to say something, but the idea of having a wife of my own at some future day, though it had often floated about in my head, sounded so strange when it was thus first spoken about by my father. He saw my confusion, and half smiling, said, "'Well, lad, what dost say to the old father's plans? Thou art but young, to be sure, but when I was thy age I would have given my right hand if I might have thought of the chance of wedding the lass I cared for.' "'My mother?' asked I, a little struck by the change of his tone of voice. "'No, not thy mother. Thy mother is a very good woman, none better. No, the lass I cared for at nineteen never knew how I loved her, and a year or two after and she was dead and ne'er knew. I think she would have been glad to have known it, poor Molly. But I had to leave the place where I lived to try and earn my bread, and I meant to come back, but whatever I did, she was dead and gone.' I had never gone there since. But if you fancy Phyllis Holman and get her to fancy you, my lad, it shall go different with you, Paul, to what it did with your father." I took counsel with myself very rapidly, and I came to a clear conclusion. "'Father,' said I, "'if I fancied Phyllis ever so much, she would never fancy me. I like her as much as I could like a sister, and she likes me as if I were her brother, her younger brother. I could see my father's countenance fall a little. "'You see, she's so clever. She's more like a man than a woman. She knows Latin and Greek.' "'She'd forget him if she'd had a house full of children,' was my father's comment on this. "'But she knows many a thing besides, and is wise as well as learned. She has been so much with her father. She would never think much of me, and I should like my wife to think a deal of her husband.' It is not just book-learning or the want of it as makes a wife think much or little of her husband," replied my father, evidently unwilling to give up a project which had taken deep root in his mind. It's a something I don't rightly know how to call it, if he's manly and sensible and straightforward. And I reckon you're that, my boy." "'I don't think I should like to have a wife taller than I am, father,' said I, smiling. He smiled, too but not heartily. "'Well,' said he, after a pause, "'it's but a few days I've been thinking of it, but had got as fond of my notion as if it had been a new engine as I'd been planning out. Here's our Paul, I thinks to myself, a good sensible breed a lad, as has never vexed or troubled his mother or me, with a good business opening out before him, age nineteen, not so bad-looking, though perhaps not to call handsome, and here's his cousin, not too near, cousin, but just nice, as one may say, aged seventeen, good and true, and well brought up to work with her hands as well as her head. A scholar, 
but that can't be helped, and is more her misfortune than her fault, seeing she is the only child of a scholar. And, as I said afore, once she's a wife and all, she'll forget it, I'll be bound, with a good fortune in land and house when it shall please the Lord to make her parents to himself, with eyes like poor Molly's for beauty, a colour that comes and goes on a milk-white skin, and as pretty a mouth. "'Why, Mr. Manning, what fair lady are you describing?' asked Mr. Holdsworth, who had come quickly and suddenly upon our tete -a tete and had caught my father's last words as he entered the room. Both my father and I felt rather abashed. It was such an odd subject for us to be talking about. But my father, like a straightforward simple man as he was, spoke out the truth. "'I have been telling Paul of Ellison's offer, and saying how good an opening it made for him.' "'I wish I'd as good,' said Mr. Holdsworth. "'But how's the business a pretty mouth?' "'You're always so full of your joking, Mr. Holdsworth,' said my father. "'I was going to say that if he and his cousin Phyllis Holman liked to make it up between them, I would put no spoke in their wheel.' "'Phyllis Holman,' said Mr. Holdsworth, "'is she the daughter of the minister farmer out at Heathbridge?' "'Have I been helping on the course of true love by letting you go there so often? I knew nothing of it.' "'There is nothing to know,' said I, more annoyed than I chose to show. "'There is no more true love in the case than may be between the first brother and sister you may choose to meet. I have been telling father she would never think of me. She is a great deal taller and cleverer, and I would rather be taller and more learned than my wife when I have one.' "'And it is she, then, that has the pretty mouth your father spoke about. I should think that would be an antidote to the cleverness and learning. But I ought to apologise for breaking in upon you last night. I came upon business to your father.' And then he and my father began to talk about many things that had no interest for me just then, and I began to go over again my conversation with my father. The more I thought about it, the more I felt that I had spoken truly about my feelings towards Phyllis Holman. I loved her dearly as a sister, but I could never fancy her as my wife. Still less could I ever think of her—yes, condescending, that is the word—condescending to marry me. I was roused from a reverie on what I should like to think my possible wife to be, by hearing my father's warm praise of the minister as a most unusual character how they had got back from the diameter of driving-wheels to the subject of the Holmans I could never tell, but I saw that my father's weighty praises were exciting some curiosity in Mr. Holdsworth's mind. Indeed, he said almost in a voice of reproach, "'Why, Paul, you never told me what kind of a fellow this minister-cousin of yours was.' "'I don't know that I found out, sir,' said I. "'But if I had, I don't think you'd have listened to me as you've done to my father.' "'No, most likely not, old fellow,' replied Mr. Holdsworth, laughing. And again and afresh I saw what a handsome, pleasant, clear face his was, and though this evening I had been a bit put out with him, through his sudden coming and his having heard my father's open-hearted confidence, my hero resumed all his empire over me by his bright, merry laugh. And if he had not resumed his old place that night, he would have done so the next day, when, after my father's departure, Mr. Holdsworth spoke about him with just such respect for his character, such ungrudging admiration of his great mechanical genius, that I was compelled to say, almost unawares, "'Thank you, sir. I am very much obliged to you.' "'Oh, you're not at all. I am only speaking the truth. He is a Birmingham workman, self-educated, one may say, having never associated with stimulating minds, or had what advantages travel and contact with the world may be supposed to afford, working out his own thoughts into steel and iron, making a scientific name for himself, a fortune if it pleases him to work for money, and keeping his singleness of heart, his perfect simplicity of manner. It puts me out of patience to think of my expensive schooling, my travels hither and thither, my heaps of scientific books, and I have done nothing to speak of. But it's evidently good blood. There's that Mr. Holman, that cousin of yours, made of the same stuff." "'But he's only cousin because he married my mother's second cousin,' said I. "'That knocks a pretty theory on the head, and twice over, too. I should like to make Holman's acquaintance.' "'I am sure they would be glad to see you at Hope Farm,' said I eagerly. "'In fact, they've asked me to bring you several times, only I thought you would find it dull.' 
"'Not at all. I can't go yet, though, even if you do get me an invitation. For the blank company wants me to go to the blank valley, and look over the ground a bit for them, to see if it would do for a branch line. It's a job which may take me away for some time, but I shall be backwards and forwards, and you're quite up to doing what is needed in my absence. The only work that may be beyond you is keeping old Jeevens from drinking.' He went on, giving me directions about the management of the men employed on the line, and no more was said then, or for several months, about his going up to Hope Farm. He went off into Blank Valley, a dark overshadowed dale, where the sun seemed to set behind the hills before four o'clock on midsummer afternoon. Perhaps it was this that brought on the attack of low fever which he had soon, after the beginning of the new year. He is very ill for many weeks, almost many months. A married sister, his only relation, I think, came down from London to nurse him, and I went over to him when I could to see him, and give him masculine news, as he called it, reports of the progress of the line, which I am glad to say I was able to carry on in his absence, in the slow, gradual way which suited the company best, while trade was in a languid state and money dear in the market. Of course, with this occupation for my scanty leisure, I did not often go over to Hope Farm. Whenever I did go, I met with a thorough welcome, and many inquiries were made as to Holdsworth's illness, and the progress of his recovery. End of section 3